Hi, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Let me try to find the live stream here and see if we're five by five. The local time is 1.45 a.m. on Friday, and we will begin this program at the top of the hour. That's 15 minutes from now. But uh, I think it's about a 50-50 shot that this is actually working at the moment. So let's, uh, that the audio is working at the moment. Hey, we're five by five, seriously? Well, that's awfully nice to see. I started a couple minutes early because I, is it worth talking about? Probably not. But if you recall, two weeks ago when we tried this, I started a live stream and the audio was not functional. And then I had to start a different stream and find the proper channel. But I guess I lucked into what I needed. So let's be uh, careful about this, because if you're watching this in replay, you're like, hey, start the talk. Well, let me say it one more time, just to make sure that we're clear. Thank you for tuning into this talk. It's a geology seminar, but today's topic is more uh, NASA and outreach uh, from Darcy Snowden, who uh, works at CWU in the physics department. And I hope that you enjoy this talk. Uh, it's 11.46 a.m. And we will begin this program in 14 minutes. So in replay, you can go ahead. You can scrub ahead 14 minutes uh, to see the beginning. And there'll be a couple of announcements as well. So I suppose Darcy will start talking uh, five minutes after the top of the hour. Let's say hi to a few of you and uh, make sure that we're OK. Darcy's outside uh, communicating and uh, visiting with everybody. Communicating. Uh, Backcountry Gary says five by five in Smoky Point. Where's Smoky Point, Gary? Uh, Therese, Doug, Pam, Charles. Uh, where are you viewing from, everybody? Anna Cordes, Washington. Dick, you're in a hospital bed. Get well, Dick. You're in the, ne the Netherlands right now. Get well soon, please. Uh, can I scroll back? Yeah, I guess I can with this iPad. Uh, Los Gatos, California. Hello, Laura. Musician, if I recall. Um, Evansville, Indiana, Palm Springs, California, Spokane Valley, Washington, Lincoln City, Oregon, Jacksonville, Oregon, Burlington, Massachusetts, Therese is 5x5 five five in the Netherlands. Um, why not, before I forget and before I turn the camera around and, and give you a sense of who's here, hardly anybody's in the room uh, right now except for the four horsemen from Notre Dame here outlined against a blue-gray October sky, plus the rock liquor making an appearance. Now you, now you have to see what's going on. And Walter. Um, let's make sure that you know that uh, I think most of you know this, but just in case. I'll be in here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And uh, this is the Baja BC A to Z live stream series that many of you, maybe most of you, have been watching regularly. Thanks again for that. Uh, so uh, tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific, January 21st, the year 2023, um, I will be with uh, two guests, one from France and one from uh, Victoria, BC. Uh, it's going to be a doozy of a show. I, I, I can say that without question. So uh, looking forward to that. I think I selected the title for that tomorrow morning show. I think I picked um, Fixed Archipelago. And uh, Stephen Johnston from Edmonton, Alberta, will be joining us January 25th. And uh, Bob Hildebrand from Tucson, Arizona, for a couple of shows. So that's not... That's not the lecture you're about to see, of course. That's a totally different series, but there's a lot going on right now. And um, I'm so grateful that you're with us live or watching this in replay. That's our speaker, Darcy, getting ready. And we're going to test her audio in just a second. Looks like you got 130 of you watching right now. Let's say hi to a few more of you. And then we'll start worrying about other matters like can you hear Darcy, et cetera. We can try it, yeah. If you just push, kind of push and hold until it turns blue. 
Good. Is that working? Well, I guess we'll find out. Let's uh, <laughs> let's talk. Uh, going through your notes, I see. Yeah. Um, so, uh, did you grow up in Washington? No, I grew up in uh, Missoula, Montana. Missoula, Montana. Yeah. Oh, Which I know you're familiar that. with. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of our boys went there. Had a good time. <laughs> yep. Were your parents professors at the university? Nope. Uh, no, mom was a bookkeeper and my dad worked at the car dealership. Ah, hey. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Darcy is fine. So they can hear you just fine. Yeah, great. We'll just keep that on if you don't mind. Uh, even though people will eavesdrop a little bit on you as you... That's fine. I, I won't say yeah. anything too bad. And did you go to UW right away as an undergrad? No, actually, as an undergrad, I went to Harvey Mudd College, which is in Claremont, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, boldly went there. Had never visited campus before I accepted, but yeah, I wanted the best. And that was the best that I got into. Ah, so, And then I went to UW for graduate school. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Well, good. Yeah, they can hear you just fine. There's okay. Hamisham Lou. I'm about ready to go to New Zealand. When are you taking off? Tuesday. Tuesday morning. Let's go. Woo! 13-hour flight. Oh, man. I know. <laughs> cool. I'll sleep the whole time, probably. Are you being preventative here? Yeah. This okay. is what this is. Yeah. I am not messing this trip up. <laughs> how, how long are you there for? Two weeks. Oh, wow. And that's for research? All right. Uh, well. for I don't want to over talk. You'll probably hear Darcy talking cool. to Hannah. You know Hannah. Canceled she gave a talk a couple weeks oh, ago. Oh, man. Yeah. It's time. <laughs> so let me swing you around. And uh, yeah, Brian says, they're sham blues. Very good. Okay. <laughs> so just reminding you, they can hear you. So Okay. Uh, great. I think we're all systems go. No pun intended. Wonderful. Uh, I think there might be a little bit of extra, like, once we start, like there are going to be some comments about Marie, who's our new lab manager. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Talk about whatever yeah. you need to talk about. And uh, I'm going to remember. You can still roam a little bit if you want before noon. However, you want to do it, Darcy. Did you get okay. Well, yeah. Um, it, oh yeah, you had yeah, yeah. I had nothing. I guess for those of yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you'll hear this when I talk to the How are you? to the room well, in a few minutes. But why not? I'm with you here. Are you enjoying um, Ellensburg? <laughs> okay. Friday Can you give talks, him this question? Talks, yeah. Time, like, uh, sport, uh, yeah. <laughs> scattered. What, what? That's the word I want. Mm -hmm. uh, not regular. Like one of sporadic. Favorite places in the world, mm -hmm. So the next one of these that we'll be doing. Yeah. It's not that different, is, uh, probably, in terms of what you can do. Good, good launch yeah. chance to read this. You um, uh, what did you do in between? In I was in Tucson, Arizona. I'll, I'll still be doing the Baja yeah. series. So yeah, we'll have so this two and a half years. Spontaneous, uh, and then, yeah, my goal was actually to move back to Seattle because I just live wanted to be back in the Northwest and then you know I just mean? randomly applied for a job um, here. But <laughs> once we get to uh, At some point, I was like, oh my God, I've lived in Ellensburg longer uh, in for, as an adult than anywhere else. I'm done with the Baja series and I'll be able to just live in Roswell. So it's not anymore. Oh, you can find the, mm -hmm. the link ahead of time. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like ASU yeah. or mm -hmm. a couple more hellos. Just double nice. checking. Yeah. We're okay. Tucson. And then gonna, you guys have mixed feelings Tucson. about it. Oh, Mike <laughs> yeah. Oh, There's, actually, I'm going back there next weekend. Oh, actually, okay. in Phoenix and maybe some of Tucson just for other stuff. But it's nice to visit. I'm yeah. like, it's too Darcy hot for me. Five by five. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mountain nice. In Phoenix. Uh -huh. so it's like yeah. It's a warm place in my house. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Have you tried much up here? Uh, Jordan has. Mm -hmm. I have. Some reason I haven't been like a year. Mm -hmm. As long as Darcy. Probably because okay. you're like a new faculty oh, member. No, yeah. Um, I assume it's because we're both talking, but it doesn't no, no. matter. Yeah. Darcy's five by five. Which That's is it? all I can. Is there a thing that has a clock on it? Thank you for joining. I thought there was something. Oh, over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I, I don't know, it might, should we stop talking up here? Is it okay? Should huh? I turn this off? Oh, no, you're We're chatting. I don't know if I'm like, great. it's fine. Okay. That's great. Um, but yeah, I also did a lot of biking in Tucson and kind of, I had mountain biked a little bit before I moved there, but yeah, it's so easy. There's all those mountain bike parks. Yeah, again. And then it was funny coming back up here. I finally bought like a proper full suspension mountain biking Thank stuff. You. And I was like, oh, there's mountains in mountain biking because it's just like kind of flat, usually going around. And actually, so I've gotten much better since when I lived in Tucson. And yeah. then I did a road trip last year and I did some of the uh, trails on Mount Lemon. And they are so awesome. I was like, oh, that was like one of my favorite trails I've ever done. Yeah. 
I mean, they're hard still. And of course, yeah. it like a little scary to crash on some of that stuff. But yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, there's a lot of biking in Roslyn, actually. That's one of the reasons I moved there. But I'll bike at Manastash, Leavenworth, Wenatchee, and then there's lots of trails that are just over the mountains, like Tiger Mountain. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I've biked everywhere. I probably bike most often in Roslyn. Yeah. 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 No, I don't do any races. I have some friends that do. I, like, don't want to hurt myself, so I don't need to, like, force myself to go. We'll race each other on Strava. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I really enjoy it. I need to get back into it. I don't know what happened. I think so you're going to come up and stand so next to mm. speak a little bit about Maria. Marie? If you would like yeah. to just remind myself Didn't that you, I like you I just said we should. Have yeah, like the trails up on Manastash Ridge are pretty chill in that way. They're nice. They're not, like, stressful. Like some of the West Side trails, like, they're like, this is fun. Like, oh. <laughs> I'm having fun, I think. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, morning. Oh, they're hi. moderate, show more show and tell, yeah, oh. I haven't actually, I think I know when I'm going to do it, there's, there's one interactive activity, kind of, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know if you met Deanna Marshall, she bought this for me, <laughs> got it embroidered and everything, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta represent when you're representing NASA. You gotta come, come in uniform. She wears like a full flight suit. I've seen it. It's amazing. Students think she's an astronaut, and that's like really hard to correct them. You're like, well, she could be. Maybe one day. <laughs> Just give everybody's attention. I'll go through the. Uh, Can you start talking? Good. Yeah. Do any of your physics books? Uh, I they did get advertised to from our department chair. I don't. A lot of them are going to a conference that they left at eleven thirty. I don't know if they'll come. They could always blast it on you. Yeah. We are like so. I mean, they should. It would be nice. To but we're so busy all the time. Like I, I was up to like two. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to say it gets better, but you have to at some point say no to stuff. You have to learn to say no. <laughs> it's not my specialty. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I'm about 10 years. I mean, I started one year as a lecturer, and then, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm over the curve <laughs> of some kind of curve. But, I mean, a lot of this is like... Finally figured out teaching and like was doing good research and then this got kind of thrust upon me and it's totally new so I'm like managing people so, still new stuff. so yeah new stuff still happens <laughs> if you let it okay um, we're about to start I'll announce a couple things uh, Bree's going to say a couple things about Marie and okay. then at the end of your talk I'll, I'll kind of remind you to like repeat the question so that. Uh, the folks at oh, home okay. The okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, just remind me. Okay. I'm okay. I'm not nervous. Don't worry. I've done this enough. I mean, she ate a giant thing. I was like, if she's eating, she can't. Oh. Like, when I'm nervous, I can't eat. Yeah. But she just I should probably be nervous, but <laughs> I'm too. No, you should be all hanging out. Yeah, this is <laughs> Bye.
Ah, yes, you're the self-hushing crowd. I forgot. Hey, <laughs> you guys are well-behaved. Thank you for continuing to come to these Talk Friday sessions. It's great that we have momentum with these things, and we're just going to continue motoring right along. I guess it would help if we did these every Friday, but, you know, uh, Hannah and I don't have uh, – the resources maybe to do this every Friday, plus, you know, about five or four to five talks per quarter makes sense. Before we talk about the rest of this quarter and remind you of the talks coming up, uh, we have a special announcement from Department Chair Bree McGinnis about uh, the first week of a brand new staff member. Yeah, so those of you who were there at 11, right when the food started, you already met Marie, but if not, this is Marie. Oh, yeah, you got to be able to hear yeah, me. Yeah, right. right. Okay, so this is Marie Takash, and then um, we're all supposed to move this way. So. Nope, nope. <laughs> this is Marie. Hi. Uh, so Marie is our new lab technician. Um, she was a master's student here in volcanology, graduated in 2018, went to Oregon State to work on her PhD, and is back now to help you all with research, um, researching classes, research for research sake. Um, but she is here to make sure the instruments you need work and teach you how to work them. Let's welcome Marie. Hey. Thank you, Marie. Yeah, it's an exciting time around here for sure. Hey, you need to come and uh, major in geology at CWU, just in case you didn't know that. Um, so a quick, very quickly, our next uh, Friday talk, uh, noon talk, will be uh, uh, February 10th, Friday, February 10th. Lisa Ely and Ann Egger from our department will be talking jointly, 200 Years of Women in the Field, Contributions and Controversy in Geology. Then a couple weeks later, late February, Friday, uh, uh, February 24th, Tyler Schleider, comparing whole rock and plagioclase hosted zircon records from the world's youngest super eruption. And then finally, uh, the first Friday in March, John Schellenberger, CWU Director of Native American Studies, uh, will be giving a talk, Understanding Indigenous Landscapes on the Columbia Plateau. And then we'll have uh, a handful of talks in spring as well. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with our speaker today. Darcy has an office on the third floor how many have met Darcy? How many, you, you know, less than half of you, like, you know, it's a big building. Uh, she's got physics classes that she's teaching. Um, the whole design of this building was to like have not all geology on the first floor and all <laughs> physics up on the third floor. You know, there's, there, we want mixing and there's an opportunity here for you to meet Darcy if you've not met her before, especially after you hear what she's talking about today. And so if you want to go out to lunch, with Darcy and I, after this, you are welcome to join us. And uh, I don't know, you want to come down at 4 o'clock to Cornerstone Pizza as well? Sure. What are you going to say? You have to say yes to that. But uh, you were thinking maybe you'd want to do that. So there's two <laughs> opportunities after this talk to visit with Darcy uh, about this program that she's going to share with us. Darcy grew up in Missoula, Montana, undergraduate school down in California, and the University of Washington with a PhD. Please help me welcome Darcy Snowden. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you guys for being here. I'll add to that that my PhD is actually in geophysics. So <laughs> I'm not so far from some of you guys. So if you are curious about uh, planetary science and that, that realm of geophysics, like I'm a great person to talk to about that because that's my background, Excellent. even though I'm in the physics department. OK, well, thank you guys for being here. Um, Today, I'm going to give a little bit of a different type of talk. Normally, when I've given seminars in the past, I talked about my science, which you guys can all take a deep breath of relief. You don't have to hear about particles in space and see a bunch of crazy computer simulations that are hard to understand. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about something else that I've started doing recently um, as the director of something called the Northwest Earth and Space Science Path, uh, Pathways. And that is trying to inspire the next generation of scientists with NASA science. And in particular, I'm going to talk to you about uh, our Artemis Rhodes program and how we use that to inspire the next generation of youth. Um, so my goals for you guys for this talk is to leave understanding what NSBE is. NSBE is a big grant here that we have at Central and a big program. And there is lots of opportunities for students to participate as well as uh, faculty. 
Okay, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Artemis mission because I gotta represent NASA up here. So you'll learn a little bit about that. And then I'm gonna tell you about some specific NSBE programs that if you know people around um, in the Northwest that are open for uh, more participation, okay? Um, before we get started, I would like to do uh, a land acknowledgement here. NSBE works a lot with tribal partners without, throughout the Northwest and actually throughout the nation. Um, so it's important for us to acknowledge the land that we're on. So the Ellensburg campus is on land ceded by the Shawanapum and other bands of tribes of the Yakima Nation. In the Treaty of 1855, the Yakima people remain committed stewards of the land, cherishing and protecting it as instructed by elders through generations. Okay, Nesby is honored and grateful to be here. And we look for ways to collaborate and strengthen our connection uh, to the land and understanding of the past as we prepare the next generation. Okay, and this is a fun, so Nesby works with um, tribes in our area, the Yakima Nation in particular, but we do this throughout the Northwest, so this is actually uh, in Montana, um, and our partners in Montana work with uh, the Crow and the Blackfeet there, and that's from one of their events. Okay, so what is North, the Northwest Earth and Space Sciences Pathways, which you guys will hear if you could talk to me about it, we call it NSBE for short, because that's kind of a mouthful. Um, if you look at this map, Okay, what it's showing with all the stars and the dots are official NASA facilities, NASA centers. What do you guys notice about what's going on up here? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, these are official NASA centers. If any of you guys grew up in the Northwest and have people that have worked in the aerospace industry, you guys know that there's a lot of NASA presence within Washington in terms of our aerospace companies. But in terms of an official NASA presence in the Northwest, there really isn't one, okay? So um, NSBE serves as uh, NASA's presence in the Northwest and beyond. Basically, we are um, connecting students and educators to NASA uh, assets, just like students that live in these areas um, that have a NASA center would be connected. Okay? We do that pro by providing hands-on activities that are based in NASA missions and science. And our particular uh, goal is to focus on underserved and underrepresented communities to increase their interest in STEM careers, okay? So underrepresented, um, I think these days is kind of obvious what we're talking about there. When I talk about underserved in this area, that can mean a lot of rural students. So students that live far away from college campuses and stuff like that have opportunities like what you guys are doing to come onto campus and have kind of a unique experience, okay? Uh, the, it's very important for me to emphasize that NSBE is much bigger than myself and even the presence and staff here on campus. NSBE is a big grant with a lot of partners. Um, so it's based here at, in Ellensburg in central Washington. But here you can see the list of all of our official funded uh, partners that are mostly in the Northwest, although we do have some um, representation in Arizona. Okay, and this is like really the exciting fun thing about working for NSBE or directing NSBE is that I regularly get to interact with people from like Museum of Life, Civic Science Center, um, Montana Learning Center, which is actually on this lake that I grew up uh, going to because my parents or my grandparents had a cabin there. So um, yeah, we, we collaborate together to offer all of these different experiences for students, okay? NSBE is funded by what's called NASA's Science Activation Program, okay? And the vision of NASA's Science Activation Program is to further enable NASA science experts and content into the learning environment more effectively with learners of all ages, okay? So this is a basically a bucket of money that NASA has set aside. And NSBE is one of 54 teams across the country um, these teams have different goals. They say learners of all ages. So NSBE, we're pretty focused on K through 12, but there are teams that are focused on everybody. Probably the one that most people have heard of is Astronomy Picture of the Day. That is a science activation team, okay? And throughout these 54 teams, we keep track of the, our reaches and we reach over 20 million learners um, across the US every year. This uh, science activation model is actually new for NASA. It started in 2016, and actually NSBE was funded in that first proposal call. Uh, NSBE at that time was at the University of Washington. Okay, so it's pretty new. 2016 is pretty new for this kind of thing. Uh, previous to that, NASA had something called the 1% rule. 
So what you're looking at here is NASA's science fleet. So a lot of people, I, well, I don't know what a lot of people think, but maybe a lot of people think about planetary missions when they think about NASA, or maybe they think about like the James Webb Telescope and Hubble. But NASA has a fleet for the Earth, it has a fleet for the Sun, it has a fleet for planets and then deep space objects. There's a lot of science out there, there's a lot of missions. So before science activation, each one of these missions needed to dedicate at least 1% of their budget to outreach, basically getting their science out into the public sphere, okay? And for some missions that was very effective and the assets that they produced were quite effective and useful. Um, but there was a lot of issues in terms of redundant things like two missions doing producing very similar assets but not really talking to each other. And there wasn't a lot of follow through on understanding how those assets were being used. Like if a mission made a bunch of curriculum for school kids, like no understanding about how it was maybe being used or how effective it was. Okay, so this is the reason why science activation was created. So basically, NASA took all of that money from the missions and put it into the science activation model. And if we're thinking about the future of NSP, it may not last forever. The missions didn't love that. So they may, uh, <laughs> they may at some point get that money back. Okay. All right, so let's talk about what kind of issues we can address. And by the way, I want actually to point this out before we go, okay? You guys all know NASA is funded with public dollars, okay? The reason why there was the 1% model and the science activation model is that it is important that NASA science belongs to the public, okay? We don't send all these satellites into space just so scientists can see the data and engineers can see the data. We want the public to learn what we've learned about the universe, about our planet, okay? And also just have access to it to help whatever. If you're going to build a company, right, based on climate solutions that's based on our Earth fleet, you know, that's, uh, you should be able to do that. So it is important return on investment that we do invest not just in the missions themselves, but in getting the science back out to the people. Okay, with that in mind, what are we trying to address here in the Northwest? I'm gonna focus in on this graphic uh, on Washington State, but if you guys are from say Montana or Oregon or even or Idaho, like similar issues, okay. Um, there's a, what's called the STEM opportunity gap, okay, in the idea that we today are not producing enough STEM majors, students with STEM credentials, in order to fill the available jobs, okay. So this is what we call the credential gap, and it's just one graphic from one year um, in Washington state, so you can see the deficit there, Okay, and it's only predicted to get worse in the future unless we do something, uh, some kind of intervention. Okay, so we're not producing enough STEM majors to satisfy the demand in this type of job market. Okay, so that's an issue that is actually when you think about putting money towards something that can make America better and stronger, obviously producing more STEM majors uh, can do that. That is the wrong computer. I just, is that, did I screw something up? Oh no, good, perfect. <laughs> I was like, oh no, they're so similar. I need to put a sticky note on this one. Um, okay, but you might say like, oh, of course, that's for Washington, like Seattle's got all those tech jobs. This actually is a graphic that's just for the region that Ellensburg is in, it's called the South Central region. And even in this fairly rural region, okay, of course, including like Yakima, we still have a deficit where a lot of the open jobs that pay a decent wage, pay the kind of wage that you would need to support a family, require some sort of uh, STEM credentials uh, in your degree, okay? So there's a problem here. If you go back down away from higher education and who's getting STEM degrees and you think about maybe why that is, there's definitely an issue when it comes down to student preparedness to get a STEM degree once they get to college, whether they want one or not. Okay, so there's a, there's a decent number of students that maybe want to pursue a STEM degree, but then there's a huge drop off on the students that are actually able to achieve the degree that they intended to get. And one of the issues is students preparedness when they get to college. So the graphic that you're seeing here, this data on uh, the left, there's a lot of columns here. But what it's showing is basically the percentage of each of these groups that are taking any math beyond algebra two in high school, okay? 
And why is that important? Well, if you want to major in something like physics or chemistry or even biology or something like that, you're going to need to take calculus in college. And if you haven't taken pre-calc in high school, you're not ready to jump into calculus when you get to college. Okay. So if you look at some of these uh, underrepresented groups like American Indian and Alaskan Native, less than 20% of these students are taking anything beyond Algebra 2 in high school. Okay. These graphics are a little bit fuzzy, but it kind of goes to the next step. These are the numbers of students in Washington state that take an AP exams uh, in these particular areas. Calculus AB is a very common AP exam uh, to take. Like everyone takes a little bit of math, so it's not crazy. Only in this year, 2020, 11 American Indian or Alaska Native students in all of Washington took this calculus AP exam. That's not great, right? you know, less than 100 uh, black or African-American students, okay? If you look over here, computer science, uh, which is probably like a more challenging exam to take, probably not offered as, at, at, in as many schools. Still, the numbers are very low, only eight uh, American Indian and Alaskan Native. So there's obviously a, a disproportionate, uh, certain groups are being disproportionately affected by uh, being basically prepared to uh, achieve a STEM degree once they get into college, okay? If we take this a little bit further, okay, not all STEM careers are the same as you guys know. There are certain STEM careers that actually don't have terrible statistics, like at least in terms of male-female balance, maybe it's starting to get more even. Okay, but the highest paying STEM career, so if you don't care really about saving the world, you just want to make some money, maybe be a computer scientist, maybe be an engineer, those degrees are overwhelmingly going to male students and white male students, okay? So if we think about being equitable and how we uh, educate our, our children, right, there are communities of students that are not prepared to get these high paying jobs because they're not prepared when they leave K through 12 to get the STEM degrees that they need to get these jobs in college. Okay, so that's kind of our problem. And these are the kind of problems that we are trying to address with our NSB programs, okay? We're using NASA science because it's interesting and it uh, provides uh, inspiration as I'll talk about, okay? But our goals really are to adjust that achievement gap and give students in these areas that maybe don't have the opportunities that some students do in other areas, like in, in more um, higher income school districts, to have the same opportunities to learn how to program, maybe to understand what kind of things they should do in school if they want to pursue a STEM uh, degree, just feel inspired, feel like they're part of a community, feel like they uh, belong in a STEM program, okay? So we do this generally, we're bringing NASA science and engineering to underserved and underrepresented communities by bringing, providing opportunity and inspiration. And at the same time, we need educators. We don't do all of this directly. We do it through educators, which are both formal and informal. Um, we try to increase their capabilities by uh, providing training, supplies, a support, and giving them lots of options for how they interact with our programs. So I'll describe some of that as I go. The main program that I want to talk about today that I'm going to focus on, we've got a lot, and I've got some pamphlets up here that you guys can discover later if you like. But the main one I want to talk about today is called the ROADS program, and ROADS stands for Rover Observation and Drone Survey. And this particular program, it's a month-long challenge that gives the students an opportunity to explore lots of aspects of STEM through hands-on activities. So hands-on means if you guys have done any teaching and you've learned about like the 5E model where you kind of discover it yourself. That's how we're basing these lessons and these activities. Okay. Um, teams are, can be in grades 3 through 12, and they model their own NASA mission, uh, include flying to a mission site and surveying the landscape uh, and analyzing samples. And each roads challenge, and it changes every year, takes inspiration from real NASA missions. So that in that way, we're also communicating what NASA is doing. Okay, so here's some mission patches or stickers that we made for various roads challenges. So we've done this, um, I think, for five years. And I, by the way, I didn't lead all these other ones. This, I'm kind of new as the director. Um, this patch up here, Artemis Roads, is the one I'm going to talk about today. But uh, like our last one was roads on icy worlds. So we thought about the icy moons in the solar system. There was one on asteroids. And there's been a couple on Mars. All right, so. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. 
That's kind of about Nesby. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the Artemis mission so you can understand how we're integrating it into the Artemis challenge. And NASA's got really good at PR, so they produce some really great assets in terms of videos and pictures and everything. So I'm going to leverage that and play this NASA video for you guys. Hopefully, let's see. Try that, there we go. Ignition sequence start. All engines up. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon before this dictate is out. We have achieved the earth shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking. One small step for man. And left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. It's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration, returning to the moon to stay, so we can go beyond to Mars to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. We will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And because we stand on the shoulders of the giants to go farther than humanity has ever been, we will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this goal. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. All right. That video always gets me excited. Okay. All right. I'm going to do a little interaction here. And to get you guys motivated, I brought NASA stickers. Okay. I know what the people want. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is why NASA is going back to the moon. Okay. How many people first have heard of the Artemis mission? Hopefully people have now. Good. Okay. Maybe, maybe not before the first Artemis launch. So many had. What do you guys think? I just want maybe one or two responses. Why do you think we should go back to the moon? Or why do you think we shouldn't go back to the moon? Right there. It's cool. It's cool. Okay. It's a great place to learn things about anything that might not be happening here on Earth. Don't get good asteroid impacts here on Earth. Mm -hmm. Study them, especially if they happen. Yeah, that's true. It's totally, yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. We test that these things work, and that's where we can then launch off and do more advanced missions. Yeah, like what's maybe a more advanced place we might want to go? Mars, yeah, maybe Mars. Okay. Yeah, that's great. That's a great response. Can anyone tell me what we've learned from going to the moon? What's one thing we might have we've learned? Yeah. What in particular, maybe? Uh, we've learned more than one thing, so there's lots to go ahead and pop in the back. Red. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we certainly weren't sure about that theory until we went to the moon, okay? And actually, I was going to Google this number. Maybe someone can correct me if you know better. But I think uh, during the Apollo missions, we brought something like 
800 or 900 kilograms of material back to study. It was a lot. It's a lot more than people probably think. Is it lower than that? More than that. What do you think? Oh, that's good. Okay. You were giving me like hand signals, so I was sure that I'd done something wrong. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's a lot of material to study, and we learned a lot. We did learn about the origin of the moon. We learned about the solar system during that formation, which was a violent place. We've learned about the age of everything in the solar system, okay? And we do that through asteroid impacts or under, not meteorites, basically looking at the cratering rate on the moon and comparing that to other bodies. So yeah, we've learned a ton by going to the moon and we've only gone to like a very small part of the moon really, like the parts that were easy to land on back in those days, okay? Those are all good reasons to go back to the moon. I'm not even gonna ask you if anyone thinks we shouldn't go back, but there are people that think that, sure, that's fair, okay? So these are the reasons why NASA wants to go back to the moon. And by the way, I will give you guys stickers. I'm just going to put them over here, get them at the end. OK, just remember to come up. OK, so these are the reasons why NASA wants to go back to the moon. OK, and they are related to some of the things that you guys said. One big thing is to demonstrate new technologies, capabilities, and business approaches needed for future exploration, including Mars. OK, it is way easier and way safer for us to go to the moon than it is to Mars but the technology is similar that we're gonna need, okay? The problems are similar. We can launch to the moon pretty much whenever. I mean, not whenever, but almost whenever compared to going to Mars. And it's a lot shorter flight. Radiation environment is safer. Yeah, so we're training to go to Mars, okay? There's a lot more that we can learn about uh, the origins and the history of the Earth, right? You guys all well know that the Earth has been totally repaved by many different processes where the moon has basically been uh, fro frozen in the past, right, for billions of years. Um, so by studying the surface of the moon, we can learn a lot about actually the early uh, Earth, what the Earth was like uh, billions of years ago. We will learn about the moon if you're interested in that, and we actually do learn about other objects in the solar system. This is an interesting one. If we don't go back to the moon, somebody else is going to beat us back to the moon and establish a presence there. So NASA and the U.S. have a tradition of kind of setting the tone for space and space travel and how countries treat space. So I think it's important that we are the ones that go back and establish a moon base first. Okay, but we are doing it with both commercial and international partners. And the last reason is to inspire a new generation uh, and encourage careers in STEM. So this was a big thing during the Apollo missions. There was a boom after the Apollo missions of people pursuing um, these advanced degrees, and we have a lot of technology uh, that we use today to thank for those missions. Okay, so where are we going? I'm just going to play another video because I like to cheat. This one I was hoping to mute, but I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, I'll mute it. Okay, so this video is going to the South Pole of the Moon. You guys heard that. And it's zooming in, it's gonna show you basically what the South Pole looks like over uh, several Earth days. Okay, and you guys can observe. It's not the most photogenic place on the moon. <laughs> okay, and it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look down below, you can see the sun direction going woo around and around as the Moon orbits the Earth, okay? All right. While you guys are watching that, I want you to think about why we might choose, out of all the places to go on the moon, why we might choose to go to the South Pole. Some ideas you might have. What do you think? Ice. Yeah, what kind of ice? Water ice. Water ice. Why do you think it would be there? Yeah, so the bottom of those craters are what we call permanently shadowed regions. Yeah, what's another good, you have another reason? Uh, most of the craters have been planned. It's not a full 28-day night and it's 28-day day. It's a but it, you, know, you get it broken up into parts so you're not spending huge periods of time without any sunlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be what would happen in the equatorial regions, right? You'd have some long days and some long nights, okay? Yeah, if you guys watch that video carefully, you might have even noticed, right? You'll notice that there are some regions that are in permanent darkness, and you're right. 
we think that there is water ice in those, those regions. But there's also regions near it that are in nearly permanent light. Okay, what's, what are some advantages of that if we're sending humans there? Go ahead, Tim. Solar panels, energy, right. Yeah, and also, it's a little warmer, okay? It's still pretty cold, okay? But yeah, I think uh, in the cold traps in those permanent regions, something like negative 400 degrees Fahrenheit, in sunlight, you get negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit, so balmy, okay? All right. Here's my little bit of science. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but we do think that there is water ice in these permanently shadowed regions at the pole of the moon. And by the way, there are permanently shadowed regions because the moon, unlike the Earth, which has a tilt in its axis, it's pretty much aligned with the sun angle. So if you can imagine that as it rotates around, you know, because of the alignment, we get this. Uh, the sun is always at a very low angle. Okay, but these are some of the, these are, and I'm being totally unfair here, I'm representing NASA. These are the NASA missions. There are other international missions that have contributed as well. But there's some fun ones in here. I'm going to skip Lunar Prospector because that one's just kind of like, yeah, we think we see it in the spectra, but we're not sure. This one is fun, LaCrosse. Uh, it, it's actually a two-object mission. There is something called the Centaur, which is actually was just the second stage of a big rocket that they purposefully crashed into one of these dark craters on the moon. And then they followed up with this LaCrosse uh, uh, satellite, and they looked at the debris from the impact. So NASA's getting really good at just crashing stuff into things. And you can actually learn a lot from doing that. Okay. Fun fact, after it observed the plume from the uh, Centaur crash, LaCrosse also crashed into the moon. And it was observed by uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, ELRO, which was also uh, in orbit around the moon, okay? Um, those missions, that kind of data, it looks like spectra. So if you're seeing um, debris coming up from these impacts, you can observe the light from that debris and you can look at the spectra to see if you have characteristic absorption lines from water. Uh, you guys probably learned about that in your science classes and I think the instruments here can do that kind of stuff, okay? Um, and that's also how Sophia, this is a, actually it's, this mission no longer flies, literally, but uh, it, just, it just retired, but you can also uh, actually see spectra from water ice on the moon from uh, the Sophia Observatory, which is an observatory that just flies in this airplane um, and looks out into space. There's one more observation that I'll note. Uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance, or Reconnaissance Orbiter also looked at the flux of neutrons. So when cosmic rays hit the surface of the moon, uh, they produce neutrons and then the neutrons go out and interact with the other material that makes up uh, the surface of the moon. If the neutrons hit a hydrogen atom, even if it's part of water ice or something else, okay, when it hits hydrogen, they have very similar masses. So it actually loses about half of its energy and you can observe the neutron flux from space and Elro has an instrument to do that. And actually it looks for deficits of energetic neutrons uh, as evidence of where there's hydrogen and therefore a proxy for water. Okay, so cool science, but we do think there is water in these permanently shadowed regions of the moon. Okay, so what does the Artemis mission look like? The first one already happened. Hopefully you guys watched it. It is the non-crewed flight of Orion. Orion is the capsule that we're going to put people in when we go to the moon, but it didn't have people in it yet. Okay, that's Artemis 1. That one happened. Artemis 2 is the first crewed flight to the moon, and but it's just going to orbit the moon. So it'll be like Apollo 8, if you know your history. That one was the first Apollo mission to send people to the moon, but they just orbited. They didn't land as a tester. Artemis 3 is going to be the first one to land on the moon, and it will send the first woman and person of color to the moon. It's supposed to land in 2024. I don't know if that's going to happen. That seems pretty close, but that's the goal. And then after that, just like Apollo, it will continue. So there will be missions about one time per year with the goal of establishing a long-term presence of mankind, of people on the South Pole of the Moon and all of the extra stuff that goes with that. Okay, so Artemis 1, how many people watched the launch? Did anybody get up and watch it? Yeah. Cool, it was very exciting. I was nervous because it occurred to me that we just based our national challenge on Artemis and if that rocket blew up, that'd be, maybe make it a little bit hard to sell, okay. 
Um, luckily it didn't. But yeah, really cool launch uh, happened in November 2022. And then um, the Orion capsule came back and landed in the Pacific Ocean 25 days later. Uh, it was really meant to just test the Orion capsule. Uh, so it didn't have any people in it, but it did have uh, these astronauts here. Um, that's Sean. He's from the uh, European Space Agency. Snoopy is actually NASA's kind of characteristic uh, animal that we send or character that we send. And then I'm going to remember, forget this guy's name. I think his name is Moonikins or something, Commander Moonikins, this guy. <laughs> so he's just a test dummy. Um, but yeah, SLS is a cool rocket. It is the most powerful rocket that NASA has ever built. It's got different configurations going towards the future. We can make it even more powerful with different combinations of rockets and bodies and things. Um, and yeah, if people are always curious about how big it is, it's just a little bit smaller than the Saturn V, a little bit shorter, but it is more powerful than the Saturn V. This is the Artemis I trajectory. Um, so this is the trajectory that the Orion capsule took uh, in its mission around the moon. I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but you should note that they always, all these missions are going to do this figure eight uh, trajectory, and that actually just allows the capsule to get in a more stable orbit once it gets to the moon. If you guys paid attention at all to the mission, I'll play this again. I'll just put this on silence. Um, yeah, it was pretty exciting. It launched early in the morning at night. Okay, I would have loved to have been there. Again, the most powerful rocket that the NASA has ever launched. Okay, so big deal. Um, and then the rest of this video, it's just gonna show some images of the actual Orion capsule going to the moon, okay? And just like I said on the last slide, this is interesting or it's cool because this is the first time that we've sent a capsule meant for mankind uh, to the moon or humankind. Uh, since Apollo 17. So it's been a lot of years. Okay. So we have seen the, the other side of the moon since then, but we haven't seen it with a capsule that it's meant for people. Um, other things that are different about this Orion capsule, it is a solar, it is going to be powered by solar panels, which is different from the Apollo command module. Uh, it's not that much bigger, but it can fit more people because as you guys might imagine, technology has gotten a little bit smaller. So um, we can put more space inside the capsule. Uh, if I go forward a little bit, um, looking towards the other Artemis missions, we're going to add some more elements that are kind of interesting to talk about just briefly. Uh, so I talked about the Space Launch System, SLS, that's the name of the rocket. The Ryan spacecraft, that's the name of the capsule that astronauts are going to travel to the moon in. The Gateway Station is actually a station that NASA is planning to build that's going to orbit around the moon. Okay, so this will be like a thing that will happen after probably we land on the moon. Okay, but that will help us um, kind of have a constant presence on the moon, get back and forth to the surface more easily. And this is fun. Does anyone know who built this rocket or will build this rocket? What does that look like? What kind of rocket does that look like? Does that look like a NASA rocket? No. Okay, so that's an example of our um, uh, commercial partnership. So NASA has already selected SpaceX to actually uh, build what they're calling the human landing system. Good names here. Um, and so SpaceX will build the rocket that will land humans uh, on the moon and then launch back up. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so I hope you guys all agree that the Artemis mission is really cool and it's going to be exciting and it's going to be fun for a really long time. Okay. So how do we tell people about the Artemis mission? How do we inspire youth with it? Well, what NSBE does, going back to NSBE, is we're taking various elements from this mission, okay, interesting things, things that we think is cool, things that we think is interesting, and we are putting it into the challenge. We are putting it into hands-on activities that we can implement with K through 12 students, okay? But what it really uh, com is composed of is not Okay, and I'm not going to go through all nine of them. That would take more than the time that I have. Okay, but each of them, again, are related to some aspect of the Artemis mission. Um, they're also related to standards, so things that kids need to be learning in school anyway. So we kind of combine the two and look where the look for where the overlap is. Okay. Um, 
This is something that students can do in school or out of school. We also provide something called the companion course, and these are lessons that are fully aligned with the standards that are appropriate for formal education. And some of them are aligned directly with mission objectives, and then there's a few, I guess, yeah, there's a few extra. Okay, so that's also something that's available. I'm not gonna dwell on that too much, okay. But let's think about some of these mission objectives. Okay, so this is a picture actually of uh, a lander that NASA is going to send to the moon to better understand the environment where we're eventually going to send people at the South Pole. So thinking about that, can anybody tell me some of the challenges potentially of driving on the moon? What are things that might be hard about driving on the South Pole of the moon? Um, yeah. Would you put like tires with air in them? No, right? Yeah, you got to do a whole different wheel system. Yeah, what, about, what else? Yeah. Yeah, traction. Yeah, that's true. So you don't have as much like weight to give you good, give you good traction on the ground. Tim? Yeah. Yeah, thermal issues. Someone had something back there. Anybody? No? I'm making that up. Blue blue sweatshirt. Yeah. Yeah, moon dust is a huge problem for going to the moon for people and for rovers. Yeah, okay. All right, so you guys identified some of the challenges. NASA knows about those challenges and is working on it as well, okay? But that's the kind of idea that we're trying to incorporate into the, into the Artemis challenge is we have students as well do what you guys did. Think about, explore the lunar surface and think about some of the challenges of actually driving on the moon. And then we focus in on a couple of them. And I'm gonna move over here for a second. The one, the picture on the right here is supposed to represent the dust problem, okay? Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever tried to ride a bike through sand, but it's hard to do, okay? It's even worse on the moon. So we actually send teams uh, what we call simulant, regular simulant. So it's material that's supposed to be like the lunar material that's on the surface so they can explore it and understand what it's like and understand what how challenging it might be to drive through. We send them more than this. We actually send them a bigger package, um, but that's what it looks like, okay? And then we have them actually explore uh, a map of the moon and think about slopes. So that picture's gone. But if you looked at that picture, it had an image of Shackleton Crater, which is a very deep crater on the moon, about two and a half miles deep. And if you want to go into these shaded regions, you got to go down and up slopes. Okay. So students are going to think about these challenges of driving on the moon. Okay, and they'll describe them and write some stuff up and let us know what they thought about it. But then they're also going to implement some solutions. Okay, so they're actually gonna build a test course, just like NASA does. This is NASA's slope lab where they're testing their lunar rover ideas. And they're gonna test their own ideas by modifying the rover that Nesby provides for them. Okay, which looks like this, but it also comes with a box full of other Lego parts and whatever else they can come up with, okay? So they're basically implementing the engineering design process, which when I was young, I never really got to learn about what engineers did in K through 12. I think it's better now, but um, again, we're giving students the idea about what it feels like to be an engineer. They get to feel like they are an engineer, right? They're identifying a problem, testing and creating solutions, okay? At the same time, let's see if I can actually get this to work. Let me put it in the right direction. They are learning how to program. So we send them these robots. These robots are not remote control. Okay, you have to go online and code up how they move. So they will have to uh, write some code that gets these robots to move along a specific path, okay? And again, if you want to be a CS major in college, you have a huge boost if you already know how to code at least a little bit before you get there, okay? So the idea is we're giving students exposure to programming but using NASA science as an excuse to do that, okay? And students in rural communities often don't have the same assets, so they don't have robots, whatever, to play with, so um, that's nice that we provide that for them. Okay, um, I'm gonna do just one quick activity with you guys. I'm trying to keep this a little bit interactive. 
So that's a very sciencey mission objective, but we also include mission objectives that gets the students thinking about how they personally connect to NASA science, what it might be like to be an astronaut, and also gives them an opportunity to potentially make cultural connections or connections between what NASA is doing and their community, okay? So an example of this is our mission objective where students identify what they would put in their personal preference kit. So when astronauts go to space, they get to pack just a tiny little bit of stuff that's for them, their personal stuff that they like that makes them feel better, okay? It's not food, it's not, uh, you know, soap, okay? It's their stuff that they wanna have when they go to the moon and they're spending whatever, 25, 30, a year in space, okay? So I'm gonna give you guys just two minutes, okay? Maybe less than that, because I think I'm going a little bit long. So maybe a minute and a half, okay? I want you guys, maybe take out some pencil and paper, okay? And you're just gonna have to guesstimate it, and you guys can do it online if you're uh, at home watching, okay? The personal preference kits are about five by eight by two inches. They're tiny little bags and they have a weight limit of about 1.5 kilograms. You guys don't have a scale, so I put the weights of a bunch of kind of common items so you can guesstimate. Okay, couple of minutes. I want you guys to think about what you would put in your personal preference kit if you're going to the moon and write it down. You can talk to your neighbor about it. What would you put? What is important to you? <laughs> This is Nick. Sounds like there's been some audio problems on your end, but I see enough of you have audio. So I'm just going to keep rolling here. I don't know what the problem was, but I guess you need to restart. Is that true? We're almost done with this program, but I assume you can hear me and I assume you can still hear Darcy as well. The room is very loud right now. They're all doing their discussion item and I cannot show you the room because that would remove oh, Maybe I will. Thank you. Okay, good. I won't bother with the audio. In other words, I won't I won't worry about the audio. That's good. Oh, let me give you a shot of the room. I can't I can't hold it. All right, guys, let's see how we're doing for funsies. This is for the big prize. Does anybody want to tell me? And it's okay if you didn't do all the calculations. What would you bring in your personal preference kit? Go ahead. I would bring memory cards. Okay. That fit in the cameras for like personal pictures. Uh huh. I want to bring some back for me. Uh huh. A slinky. Okay. <laughs> yeah, musical instruments are huge actually with the astronauts, and there's kind of where the weight limits have seemed to slip. I don't know if you guys have seen the YouTube videos, but harmonica is great because that one would actually fit in your preference kit. Cool. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would want to bring uh, maybe some yard, like some crochet, like a, a round light. There's one that has a light yeah. light come off of it, so maybe like special space yard. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. I would definitely, I would put ear pods on mine. Like, yeah. Go ahead. Certain smells 
Okay. Yeah, that's smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's one of the reasons why NASA is trying to figure out how to grow plants in space, not just for eating, but actually improving the environment. So it smells better. It actually recycles the air. But also, yeah, they can literally smell something that smells more natural rather than, I, I hear space does not smell great after a while. That's the word on the street. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was hearing like a mini thing of knitting supplies. Uh-huh. So just like small thing of yarn and needles and stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. And probably like a deck of cards. Very cool. All right. So yeah, this is one of the activities. And we actually put within this activity, we asked students to think a little bit for several days, like journal and think about the stuff they use daily to feel better. So it's some emotional well-being within this lesson. And then at the end, we asked them to make a cultural connection. So you know, if you go back, especially if you're dealing with tribal communities or something like that, you're like, all right, what did the people in your community travel with when they went long distances? But that works for any community, right? Like when you're going far from home, what is the thing from home that you bring to, to make you feel connected? That could be art. It could be a blanket. could be a book. Okay. And the point of this is like students want to feel like... There's lots of communities that don't feel connected to NASA at all, right? How can we build those connections and show that NASA cares about their communities and what they think as well? So that's the idea behind that kind of thing. All right, I'm just going to skip this slide, although I do want to note this picture. This is Deanna Marshall. I'll talk about her in a second too. But all of this stuff, we ship out all the time. So those boxes, that's like a daily occurrence. That's what Deanna has to deal with. We are actually just a shipping operation. Just <laughs> ignore everything else I said. Okay, so this challenge culminates in a, a final challenge event, which I do want to bring up. We're planning it right now. But what you're seeing on this map is where the challenge teams are. The red dots are where the final challenge events are going to be. And we're going to try to, what I say, NASA this thing up. Okay, so there might be an astronaut coming to talk. There'll be some cool exhibits, and there'll be students here completing the final aspects of this challenge. It's going to be on June 6th. We will be looking for volunteers. Um, so please stay tuned and pay attention to that. There will be one here on campus. Uh, from each final event, we will be taking at least one team of students to the Kennedy Space Center. We did this last summer. Okay, and this is what I call the ultimate authentic NASA experience. So when we did it last summer, we, we didn't get to see the SLS. It was in this building, the Vehicle Assembly Building, but it was closed in there. <sighs> so close. Um, but we did get to see a rocket launch of a Falcon 9. Okay, so this is the kind of thing, if you're a student from a rural community that has never got to do anything cool like this, it can really change your life. Okay, that's the point. And so I'm going to end this with a personal story, talk about authentic NASA experiences. And I wish I had photos. I'm building a house right now, so all my photos are in like storage, or else I'd put like a photo of Tubby Middle School Darcy on this slide at Space Camp. Instead, I put a photo of Space Camp the movie, which I think is what inspired me to want to go to space camp in the first place. You guys can watch it, it's great. Um, but yeah, I'm calling this slide from space camp to space physicist, okay? So I know that this kind of thing can work. Like Nick said, I grew up in Montana. I didn't know any scientists or engineers growing up. Um, but I did whatever for whatever reason, get the space bug. And I was fortunate enough to have parents that sent me to space camp when I was in middle school. And it did change my life, okay? I came back and I was like, I guess I'm just going to have to get A's in all my classes. Sorry, guys. I'm signing up for that, and I'm going to go to the best college I can get into, and I'm going to get paid by NASA one way or another from being 22 till today, okay? So it does work, okay? Um, I'm obviously not really an astronaut, but I do work with NASA all the time, and I don't take it for granted because it was the dream that I had when I was young. Um, the next year of NASP, this is just a little advertisement. So if you do know people that might be interested in Artemis Rhodes, the registration for teams is open a little bit longer. In the summertime, we're going to do mini missions, which are basically you implementing some of the Artemis Rhodes objectives wherever you are. So these are more people that are maybe listening on the internet or listening later. Um, so if you're at your own school or your own community center, and there's going to be a couple of resi residential camp here at Central. One is on uh, Mars science. 
The other one is actually on high altitude ballooning. And we will be looking for student employees to help work those camps. So if that's something you're interested in, again, let me know. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that NSBE is a huge partnership, like I said in the beginning. I cannot even talk without acknowledging Deanna Marshall, who is the only full-time employee for NSBE and does a ton of work. She's not here right now because she's actually doing women in physics things, okay? Um, but she is very hardworking as well as all of the NSBE partners. And I have to acknowledge my mentor, Robert Wingley, who is the original director of NSBE that unfortunately passed away, which is why I'm in the position I'm in now. Okay, but this was his idea and this is his legacy. Okay, and that is the end of my talk. I'm just throwing up here some stats from our last year uh, in terms of numbers of engaged and where we engaged people. And yeah, any questions that you guys have, go for it. Well, let's thank you first of yeah. all, my goodness. <laughs> okay. Yeah, some questions for Darcy, and she will repeat your question so that the home folks can hear the question as well. Go ahead. What's your recipe for artificial moon dust? Oh, I wish I knew. Um, we buy it from a place called Exolith Labs, which is in Florida. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The question was, what is the recipe for artificial moon dust? <laughs> and so, yeah, we purchase it from a place called Exolith Labs. Uh, Simulant or Exolith Labs, and they're based in Florida, and they're the same company that makes it for NASA and other research purposes, and they create, they basically grind up the material that is in uh, Lunar Regulus, so they take the minerals and they grind it up and make their own. The stuff that we provide to students is the educational version, so it's like the cheap version, you know, it doesn't have all the expensive stuff in it. Um, but what we ask the students to do, speaking of recipes, is to examine it and then find something else, their own simulant for the simulant to drive their robot through. So you guys could think about your own ideas about what you might use for that. But we didn't provide enough. This is all we provide them because it's not super cheap. It is like research grade. So we don't provide them enough to drive their robots through. So they have to come up with another material. Yeah, good question. I know. Oh my God, if I had time to, yeah, to, so what I, I don't know, did I say on this? I didn't put it on the slide, but um, did I, let's see, which slide was it? There are something like, yeah, we have 258 challenge teams, so I don't want to crush that many rocks. <laughs> yeah, that's too many. Yes. Oh yeah, it'll do that. Oh no, that leaked a lot. No, oh, well. Let's zoom in on that. I guess I'm going to the moon after all. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, that's been a bit of an issue that we are learning about when we're shipping that. So, not surprised. Okay, any other questions? Good. Uh, I don't know. So the question was, why are we so worried about other countries getting to the moon before us? I mean, that's a big question for me to answer. And I have to be clear that if I do try to answer the question, I'm not re representing NASA <laughs> in my response because I don't want to speculate. But I mean, we can all probably come up with our own answers to that question. I think that there's a lot of things that you could do from the moon or use the moon for. Um, and if you probably don't want to allow it to be used for a defensive purposes or something like that, um, I don't know, or it could just be a national pride thing. I mean, the space race is still alive. We, we, um, we do work a lot with all of the international, like we work with Indian space industry or in, uh, agencies. We work a lot with European space agencies, but maybe not so much with China or Russia these days, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. I'll say nothing more on that, or else I'll probably get in trouble. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge um, with the Artemis, Artemis mission going back to the moon for the first time? In oh, so the question was, what do I think the biggest challenge is going back to the moon for the first time in decades? Oh, that's such a <laughs> that's also a really good question. Um, I think that you know. It's I, one of the challenges I think is the fact that NASA hasn't done anything that big in a long time. So everything has to kind of be built 
from scratch. Like the SLS took a really long time to develop because NASA had kind of put that kind of rocket to the side. Um, in terms of like living on the moon and surviving on the moon, like there are issues that we really haven't resolved with radiation and exposure to radiation that are an issue. And yeah, like I don't think we really know how to keep people safe in a habitat for a long time. It's going to be a long process before people are really living on the moon. But I think, yeah, just keeping people safe is the biggest issue. If there's a big solar storm while astronauts are out there. They really are exposed. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, our main goal, That's I think, is to continue to grow the number of students that we serve, but also to build more community with some specific groups in the Northwest. So as you might imagine, actually, Nesby was on a good track for building community with certain partners, tribal communities. COVID made it very difficult to maintain those relationships. So a big goal in the next few years would be to rebuild relationships and understand the needs of community. So we are not just doing stuff that we think is fun, which I could go all day with this stuff, but maybe it's not what the people really need. Yeah. Any other questions? One more. It's okay if you don't. Go ahead. Why does it take 50 years to go back? <laughs> Oh, good question. Um, well, NASA only has so much funding, I would say, and it just wasn't a priority during the shuttle era. The shuttle was quite expensive to operate. So that kind of, in terms of manned space flight, sucked all the life out of the ability to do these longer missions. And then once the shuttle was done, yeah, it, we, it took a long time to develop the technologies again, right, to be able to go back to the moon. So, and as well, as you probably know, you know, every president actually gets to reset NASA's uh, missions and agenda. So that's not helpful always for the, trying to do these things that take a long time. You know, people are like, we're going to go to Mars, we're going to go to the moon. Just kidding, we're not going to do any of it. Just kidding, we are. So it's like, <laughs> um, that can make it really hard too. Yeah. And actually some of the success of like SpaceX and all that, I mean, I'm sure that's propelling NASA to really get it done more than if that didn't exist. Yeah. Hey, let's thank Darcy one more time for a great talk. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay, I'm not going to touch anything. Oh, yeah, come get your NASA stickers. If you ask me anything at all, and the don't leave without it. I know who gets the calendar. Hopefully I brought enough. Only Thank you for you. <laughs> that back one. Oh, great job. Great job. All right. So Darcy is off. I'm uh, continuing to chat with you, home viewer. And uh, I want to say a couple of final words to you. Let me swing you around. Well, I guess we can kind of keep it here for a little while. Let's uh, hang on. Am I missing anybody? Well, I I think it's just me that's chatting now to you, and uh, I want to thank you for tuning in. Those that watched live, looks like we had about 250 of you on average, like or 274 right now. Um, this continues to be kind of an experiment, uh, broadcasting these live, and then of course most of you watching these in replay. Has it dawned on you why we're trying this? And by we, I really mean me. Um, to me, this is a whole new way to market a university and specifically to market science programs here at Central Washington University. Um, you can be in this room on a regular basis. Are you thinking about going to a university? You are? Okay. Are you thinking about doing geology or are you thinking about doing physics? Or are you thinking about doing astronomy or geophysics? 
This room is just one of many rooms in this building called Discovery Hall. That's right, Discovery Hall. And instead of printing brochures and sending things through the mail and hoping you take a campus tour sometime, this is my idea. The main reason for broadcasting these Friday talks is not only to just do some geology stuff on the internet, but to advertise the public, advertise to the public that we have a cooking thing here. And, you know, who have you seen the last couple of shows? You've seen Darcy Snowden today, who has an office on the third floor. Two weeks ago, you saw Hannah Shamlu, who has an office on the second floor. And you are welcome to come anytime to visit this building and also to visit Vinman's Bakery. Jeff doesn't want to be on camera. Jeff was the guy with the last question. What was your question again? Why did it take 50 years? Why did it take 50 years to return to the moon? And uh, Jeff wants to stay off camera, but you need to know that he continues to support us by walking up a couple of boxes of goodies free to us every time. So it's the weather's turning here. Our snow is almost gone. I'm on my bicycle all the time now. And that means it's easier to travel. And, you know, as we get into spring, I'll be reminding you all that you can come and visit here. This is a public building. And, of course, Vinman's Bakery is just down the hall. You've got to love it. So before I sign off, let me just make sure that we're still actually communicating. And... Uh, Still had trouble with that face camera. Uh, I don't know what that's. It didn't die on me, but it. it uh, I had to keep restarting it and doing all that. So, yeah. So, um, yes, thank you. I'm glad that you're there. And are, are most of you at home uh, over the age of, you know, 60? Yeah, probably. So I guess if you were a devil's advocate, you're like, well, why are you advertising to a bunch of old people? Well, I'm an old person. But... It's more than just old people watching these. And what's the marketing budget for doing this? Zero. There's no money. I'm all set up to do this. So why not do it? With Nat Nichols' help, I can do this. So just thought I'd... I don't know why. I was just inspired by that talk today. And... Uh, Instead of hinting at it, I thought I'd just tell you it right up front. I want to make sure we stay healthy in this building, both geology and physics. And our numbers are strong in geology. I'm not sure about physics, but in geology, we've, we have strong numbers. In part, maybe a small part, but in part because of this YouTube stuff. So makes me feel great. And the trends are not particularly promising with universities in the West, maybe across the country, maybe around the world, I don't know, enrollment-wise, but we're strong, and maybe it's in small part because of what we're doing here. So, great. Thank you for tuning in today, everybody. Um, I will um, see some of you tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning is January 21st, Saturday morning, 9 o'clock Pacific time, 9 a.m. Uh, in, 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 the, in the room here. i got to set everything up. Uh, after I take Darcy to lunch. All right. Thank you. I love you and goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Goodbye. <laughs>